All right, everybody. Uh, welcome again to yet another OpenShift Commons briefing. Feels like um, every day we're online, um, and it's no different today. And so we're a little late starting, so I apologize for that. But today, Jay Bloom and I are going to try and recap all of the books, which is impossible, that every one of the speakers on all the Transformation Friday sessions and other sessions that have been done over 2020 um, that people have mentioned or recommended, and we're not going to do it justice, um, but some of the ones that influenced us and um, where we're going um, and what we're going to be reading, hopefully, over the holiday break, which is always a joke because we always end up just eating too much food and uh, playing video games or playing with our kids or going outside, which is what you should be doing. But if you were going to do that, you know, January 1st, I'm going to read these books and be serious about catching up on all of these books. These are some of the books that um, influenced us a bit over the past year. And I'm going to start this whole thing off um, by making a confession. Everybody comes to these OpenShift Commons briefings and they um, tell, I think of them personally for me, as little tutorials on um, subjects that I don't know enough a lot or thought leaders in a space that I'm interested in. And so these have been for me over the past three, four years that I've been doing them, um, basically tutorials for the community and for myself to avoid reading the books um, and be able to get a synopsis quickly and succinctly from sometimes the author of the book, like um, with Digital Nudge and Fabio Piero, who came a couple weeks back. And, um, and then, then if it sparks joy, as uh, Maria Kondo would have said, um, then I may go and download it to my Kindle and read it. Uh, and if it doesn't spark joy or it doesn't tweak my interest, it usually goes right out of the back of my brain. Um, and so one of the, the things that um, we're going to try and do today, and um, hopefully Jabe is, is on board with me about this um, rockin' and rollin' today, is it's to talk about some of the seminal books that influenced us um, it, over the past uh, I don't know, 20 years or so that we've been reading books about um, organizational change, um, computer science, uh, DevOps as it arose, um, and other things that influence us about um, cultural shifts and, you know, relationship maybe building. I think a couple of them, how to win friends and influence people became one of the things that Andrew um, suggested we, we recommend. But I'm also going to tell this story about this book. I don't have slides today, and this may be coming out backwards if you can't read it. It's The Mythical Man Month. And back when I was in computer science in the Dark Ages, um, it was the book that was, it was a textbook, basically, um, by uh, Frederick Brooks, Jr., um, an IBMer, and it came out in 1975, so it was uh, 10 years old by the time I first read it already. But it really um, shaped the way that I thought about um, software engineering and teams and communication between teams. And um, I think one of the, the key things that I, takeaways that for me was um, adding more resources to a team didn't always help the project go faster. Like if I could say that the, the one underlying thread that I walked away with that has always influenced me is how important the lines of communications were. Um, and the myth of adding more people to a project doesn't help it get done any faster. So if you haven't read this book yet, I don't know, Jabe, have you read Mythical Man Month? I, I'm, you must have. What, when did you read it and how, what did you get from it? Um, so I read, I read Mythical Man Month, I think maybe, maybe 18 years ago, like early in my career, uh, I read it. Um, he actually got another really interesting book about, on, on design theory more that's more general design theory but um i think that like there's a couple really interesting things brooks's law of course is really famous from that book and it involves like understanding teams as being like a, a communication network and mm -hmm. i think that's really um been super influential in agile and the way that people imagine like the two pizza team theory um and so that, that's, I think that's super important. Um, I used to, when I was early in my dissertation on temporality, I used to talk a lot about how the way that he uses the, um, 
the metaphor of a woman being pregnant as a way as a form of time that can't be collapsed as a, mm-hmm. as a way of talking about like duration or the way it just sometimes it takes time to do things um and trying to give people like a better idea of how to identify those moments i think that's kind of interesting yeah so so that was that was for me um probably one one of the, because it was a textbook i had to read it right yeah. it was assigned and we were you know and so brooks law sort of influenced everything else um for the ways that we thought about things but um recently um there's been you know not recent let's let's talk let's go historically a little bit um the i want to call it the fifth element i know that's not it's not the name of the book um the peter peter sangate's book that's the fifth discipline um, discipline fifth elements a wonderful movie you should watch it i watch it it's repeatedly. excellent i love it it's excellent we'll be love best. <laughs> luke besson i love he can do no wrong well maybe he can but um he's done a few wrong but anyways um peter Senge, um a, a book that i um really should have read okay it's one of those books that everybody talks about systems thinking everybody yep. pretends that they know what we mean when we say systems thinking and yep. here's the guy who basically started the whole genre or, or the the con- concepts around it and and frankly um i I did one of those things, nodding. Every time someone said systems thinking, I'd be like, yeah, oh yeah, I, I know what that is. And I never really read the book and never really got it. I conceptually got it, but so um, this week in between other Zoom meetings, I um, looked at the book list that we generated here and went and watched the three minute synopsis of, <laughs> of the book. You can, you know, sort of like the, what were those cliff notes, but the video one of it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, so this, it twigged my, yes, my interest. So then I watched a longer YouTube video. And I think that's what's happening is that now we, um, rather than read the actual book, the physical book, we watch the YouTube lecture by the author who talks about the book um, yeah. a lot more than reading the book. And we simply just don't get as much out of it. Though I must say that Peter Senge's um, talk that he gave in Finland a while ago really um i don't know if you and i should have I, i'll say i'll throw in the video link here for folks who are watching along um he he does he talks about systems thinking in a way that i finally got it mm-hmm. um he talks about it and it's probably in the book which i should have read and now i'm it is the one book i think on this list that i am going to read and get um over the christmas holiday because it, it intrigued me he talks about um systems in terms of uh, native cultures mm. uh, having um, early days the religions were more um, connected and they to humans and nature those were two, they, they were one system and one way we were one with that and when the separation when we started separating humans from nature um, that created another layer of systems above it which set the separation and the the story that he tells and i'm going to bash it so you should watch the video um is he says he talks about plugging in his iphone or whatever phone it is into the wall socket and getting electricity yep. and how we don't even think about the complexity of the systems behind that we just do it so yep. and so the electricity is coming from coal or electric powered you know nuclear power plants and he basically says something like yeah, it's all dead shit, right? You know, <laughs> those, that is nature. It's coming from nature and ignoring that system. Yeah. And, and he's in the talk he's giving is more about climate change and, um, you know, the things that are going on in the natural world and how we're destroying the universe that we live in. And what we need to do is have better systems thinking about when we do things. He tells a wonderful story about. Um, growing up in LA and the orange groves and the lemon groves and the, the how beautiful Los Angeles was when he was a young child and getting to play outside and how in his lifetime the 10 years of his lifetime um, he went from being able to play outside to having smog alerts and mm-hmm. all the orange groves and lemon groves and everything else were being cut down yeah and what he said what that sparked my interest really was that had you asked the developers and you know the private contractors who were plowing down the 
the lemon grows and the orange grows, if they, um, you know, if they wanted to, dis you know, if they intentionally wanted to destroy the air, or if they were wanted to intentionally have their children grow up in a place um, where there was no place to play outside, um, where this, you know, this thing, and they would have all said no. Like if you had framed it like that, if you had told them at the beginning of the boom in L.A., and this is, you know, around the world too. I mean, this is just one story. Had they been doing systems thinking at that juncture and had an understanding of what was, you know, the impact or how all of these things were interconnected, then um, they might not have made the decisions they made. And my Los Angeles nephews might be growing up in lemon lemon trees yep. and orange groves with, with clear air. So that, that for me, caught me. Um, so I'm definitely going to read that book. So did have you read Peter's book? This I time? have. Uh, I, I, you know, I actually teach a class on systems theory at Carnegie Mellon, which is uh, super fun. And I'm, I'll, I'm going to teach it next semester. Um, and, you know, Senge's book, I think, is particularly interesting because it, I, I have, like, you know, in my mind, there is uh, Boston is like a place where a certain form of systems thinking kind of arises. Um, and, uh, you know, the earlier forms of systems thinking, um, like general systems thinking uh, from like von Bartenhoffle and stuff like that, the, these guys were basically concerned with, with the way in which um, – uh, the study in, in university, especially in the sciences, was fragmenting. So, like, uh, that they couldn't uh, explain how physics and biology work together. They basically were like, these are two different levels, and they don't appear to align usefully any any way. And so, systems thinking, in a lot of ways, was initially about um, expanding uh, the domain or the the use of the metaphors and language of biology into other areas, into other realms. Um, because biologists tend to think about things like environments and organs and the interrelationships between things. Um, and, and these become kind of important ways of thinking through um, how, how things evolve, right? Um, and, and you get all sorts of weird, interesting versions of like, Stability and instability and, and interesting conversations about social systems uh, that are using biological language or biological metaphors. So I think that um, is kind of super cool and interesting. Um, Jer Jerry Weinberg has a great book called An Introduction to General Systems Theory that's like a little bit more abstract than um, – than, uh, um, So this, this course that you're teaching at um... – Carnegie Mellon. Yep. Um, is is that an open course or is it something that people it's can? Part of, so like uh, what I study at Carnegie Mellon and what I teach at Carnegie Mellon is is called transition design and it's, um, so the systems thinking class is part of transition design. Systems thinking is a is a critical part of transition design. Uh, kind of like the way you were describing, like understanding the environmental cycles and things like that are all important. And then as designers, like learning to think about those things and, and recognize them becomes really important. Um, so yeah, I um, if people want to learn, if people want to take a course on systems thinking, one of the ones I could re recommend is that Kent Beck um, and Jess, uh, Jessitron are um, currently running a course on it, uh, and it's their second time through, um, and I think they do a really good job. And I think it's really interesting to. I always assumed that people like Kent already had systems thinking on board, but it's clearly something that he is still engaged with grappling with, which is kind of interesting. Anyway, I, the, the Senge's book is great because it basically takes all of those like kind of more cybernetic uh, systems theories about kind of machine interactions and human interactions with machines and stuff like that, and then just makes it almost purely about a social system, um, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, some really interesting insights in there, and the like. The most kind of contemporary version of that is called Theory U, which is also taught at NYU. I'm sorry, uh, at MIT, um, and that's um, yeah, it's, it's another kind of like uh, 
system transition, like system movement uh, set of theories about how systems move and how they change and how they become other things, which I think is kind of like a fascinating version of what systems uh, becomes. So, and, and, and the fifth di discipline, um, the fifth discipline being systems thinking, by the way, um, is, a, is a really interesting early uh, a, a kind of way of talking about and thinking about systems thinking. So I think it's a really valuable read for people who haven't read it yet. So, um, so you mentioned design thinking. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a seminal good book to get started on design thinking? Yeah, I mean, so the thing that I always encourage people, like design thinking as it has arisen recently from IDEO, right, which is a kind of a particular form of design thinking is not my favorite version of design thinking. Um, additionally, like I, I think that most human-centered design is pretty confused and actually probably really dangerous. Um, there's a, there's a reason why we live in unsustainable societies, and it's because we've been focusing on human needs for a long time as designers. Um, so uh, my my favorite book uh, on design thinking in particular is called Design Thinking, and it's by Nigel Cross. And the basic theory in that book is that um, you can look at a modern university, the current contemporary university, and see that it's divided into humanities and sciences, and that these are two um, dominant ways of thinking about the world. Mm -hmm. um, and often when people say, what is design, they want to say it's either an art or a science. So there's actually stuff called design sciences, um, which actually emerged from Carnegie Mellon originally, and then there's and Herbert Simon and people like that. And then there's another kind of version of it where design is aesthetics and therefore probably belongs in the humanities. Uh, and it, the current part, department that I'm in right now, the School of Design, is in fact in the humanities department. Oh. Cross's argument is that design should be treated as a peer of the other two, that it is in fact not a science and it is also not a, um, a humanity. It's actually a third way of kind of thinking about, knowing about, being in the world. Um, and that um, because it's so radically under-theorized right now, so people don't have a really good idea what design is, they don't realize that, um, you know, in the same way that you kind of talk to your kids these days about like, they need to be science literate, uh, they need to be literate, they need to be able to read and understand kind of narratives and stories in order to kind of enjoy the world that we live in, you know, to, to understand how a movie works or how a poem works or all those things. Those are humanities-based structures, right? And, and so most people would argue, I mean, most people would argue that you have to be able to read a newspaper to be a, you know, participant in a modern democracy, all that kind of stuff. So, and then you could say like science lit literacy is a hugely important thing that people need to be better at and we pay a huge penalty for the lack of science literacy in the United States right now, you know, and you could say things like um, sustainability and the ecological crisis are based in a lack of scientific literacy. So that's another set of literacies that are important. And then the last one that Cross would argue is that all of us are engaged in the same way we're all engaged in scientific discussions, whether we're literate about them or not. The same way we're discuss, kind of engaged in humanities discussions by telling stories and narratives. All of us basically design things all the time. We, we, we put our room together in a certain way. We, we organize things in a certain way. We organize our computer systems in certain ways. All of us are designing things. But for some reason, you start learning about science and humanities in grade school, and no, almost no, almost everyone uh, graduates from college without having a formal design uh, education in any useful way. Uh, the 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 most most people get out of kind of a design literacy is maybe they go into an engineering program and then they learn like a version of design which is kind of a um, a science influenced version of design um, so that they understand how to put things together in scientifically valid kind of ways. Like I can build a bridge now. Um, yeah. But that's not like the day to day, everyday way of being that all of us kind of always engage in. How could children and adults think better about, again, like putting your room together and 
What's the value of that? Uh, and I think there's just significant, huge value in that, in that right now, uh, you know, most of the world is designed. Most of the world has been designed by someone. Mm -hmm. uh, almost all of the world is artificial. It's not natural anymore, right? You don't interact with nature directly. And therefore, like, having some understanding of how it got that way, like how people who designed it were thinking so that you could critique it, you could engage it, so that you have some literal literary engagement in this idea that like the physical world around you that's been designed is shaping your lifestyle, the way you live, the way you think about things. Um, and most people just walk through life not realizing that like, that stuff has been put there on purpose and it's shaping your decisions. And so maybe that would be something we should train more people in understanding, I guess. So, so that's, a, that's a good read. And it, what it makes me think of is um, uh, uh, I, uh, there's a, a book about community development um, by Jono Bacon. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that is sort of if you're in open source and you're doing community management of any ilk, um, you, you will have read, um, or you should have read, and it's uh, called The Art of Community. And it's a very good book, but it is, I, I can remember reading it the first time going, not having any aha moments, because it was all, um, I'd been doing this kind of work for a long time, I was just really glad that there was like a primer for it. But the thing that felt missing was, um, for me, initially, was the science side of it, the data-driven aspect of it, the let's really look at how all of these people are connected and why. Um, and so I, I've been like in the back of my, um, on, on the back burner, I've been like thinking of writing the corollary to that, the science of community development, you know, or beyond beyond doing it by gut or whatever. But this, um, but since I've been hanging out with you guys and your design thinking and the systems thinking and doing these organizational stuff, I actually think that what I would like to see is to go back a step and to yeah. think about how how open source communities were designed, you know, yeah, how they how they were actually, you know, because they were intentionally created. There was an intention behind them to facilitate yeah. it, and how they've grown, and how those intentions have changed, and how the systems underneath all of those open source communities that that I work in, and and ecosystems, and and how that influences where we are right now, and sometimes where we're stuck right now um, yeah. and when we have all these conversations about diversity and inclusivity and we're trying to retrofit our communities to be you know better healthier more engaged um, more diverse and more innovative um, but if we don't step back and look at how they were intentionally designed then we really aren't really understanding how all the systems within them work and I think that might be a, a better approach to um, analyzing yeah, community. Think, you know, or organizational design in general, um, just as a general practice, like most of, like if you wanted to learn organizational design, and it's not community design, it's not exactly what you're talking about. What do you want to learn about organizational design? You'd go and get an MBA and teach you about like boxes and arrows and, mm. you know, spans of control and blah, blah. The, the, it's not really a design activity. It's it's like organizational engineering activity, right? It's not really about how systems work, uh, how, how social systems work. And then to extend that, it's also not clear that organizational design understands socio-technical theories of design in which like there's a social system that's mediated through a technical system. In other words, like you and I are talking through technology right now how does that influence our relationship and how we, uh, what we know about each other and how we communicate. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, that involved, especially when we look at kind of organizations like open source where, you know, um, everything is heavily mediated through ticketing systems and emails and, you know, all these types of things. So I think it's, you know, probably pretty interesting to think about it that way, like, you know, to what extent did something like GitHub radically change the nature of the way that people can organize and things like that? I think it's kind of interesting to think through. Yeah. The other book about open source that um, that I was going to read and um, a former colleague of us from CoreOS, Brandon Phillips, tweeted about it and it caught my attention was Working in Public, um, The Making and Maintenance of Open Source Software. Um, uh, 
by Nadia Egbai, I think is how, the Egbal is how, how you pronounce it. And she's um, really talking a lot about online communities and how they all interact. And I have not read the book, but um, just on Brandon's recommendation, it, it is on my actual I'm going to read this book list here. So that's uh, when we're talking about community development and open source, yeah. I think maybe um, – some of the systems thinking, the design thinking books are, are on my, my reading list. And um, and if you haven't read The Art of Community or The Mythical Man Month, those are two that I'd definitely recommend. And this looking for new books and new new ways of thinking um, about stuff. Those, those were the kind of the things that I'm probably going to read this year. The other one um, that came up recently, because, you know, when your boss recommends you to read a book um, for a meeting, you, you know, you normally do. And um, and um, my one of my many bosses, and I have lots of them at Red Hat, is how I always like to phrase it, um, suggested reading um, No Rules Rules, um, the one about Netflix. And um, I'm trying to find the author here. Um, he's the CEO. There's two, a man, Dana. And Reed Hastings and Aaron Meyer. There you go. And, and I started reading it. And um, I, I shared this with you earlier before this, this, this chat. I started reading it. And at first, I really liked it. I know a lot of people at Netflix, and Netflix has done some great open source work, and um, Adrian Cockroft and Chaos Monkey. There's lots of people that, and lots of people and great projects that have come out of Netflix. So I've, and um, so I was reading it with the curiosity of, oh, so, so this is this is the environment these folks all all lived in and grew up in, and these these ideas and projects, which is pretty amazing. Um, and it's about creating a really innovative um, organization. But it, um, there was, there's something off about it, and, and I, I can't put my finger on it. Um, and you know, they talk about um, uh, bring, you know, hiring the best um, yeah. people, um, and in, you know, the ones who are passionate about their work and at the top of their game, and um, and then figuring out, you know, whether they're a fit in the group and. You know, they, they have a whole, I think, chapter on getting rid of jerks, you know, even if they're brilliant, but they're a jerk and they don't fit in, you know, the, which is sort of a, a bow to the Silicon Valley culture of, um, you know, startups that are, you know, and I think I've been in a few of them where they're they're led by people who are somewhere on the, the manic um, uh, schism up there, you know, crazy ass and all that. But there was something about it that um, I'm now going to have to go back to my Netflix friends and ask them if um, if this isn't just a politically correct way of wrapping up um, exactly Silicon Valley culture. You know, it just it felt it, it felt a bit like they um, put a mo modern wrapping on it with a little bit more political correctness, but it still was creating an organization that and and I and I read it and it was like. The, the short version of it. So I'm sure inside of Netflix, they have some mentoring programs. They onboard people from diverse backgrounds and stuff like that. But it really read like, just hire the best of the best and make sure they fit their organizational fit. And um, But it didn't seem to, to have a part of it. And, and maybe I missed it. So I'm going to go back and read it again for raising people up, for growing people. So like right. if you were mediocre and... Um, passionate, you weren't going to get that, um, that, that inspiration. So I, I'm not sure I would recommend this book, but I know I'm going to have to read it. <laughs> so what were we're going to go ahead. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I know a lot of people at, uh, at Netflix. Um, I think it's a super interesting culture. I think there's, um, there's a lot of kind of, influence on individuation you know responsibility freedom um and and the kind of way that those two things work together to create a system um is interesting it's not um there, there's definitely some fishy parts about the book i think that's that just made me not super comfortable i i you know to one extent it's kind of like if you have as much money as netflix or spotify or google well maybe you can go out and hire quote unquote the best people in the world whatever that means uh but that's maybe not great advice for most of the planet because you know you can't not everybody can afford the type of kind of salaries that netflix and and google are putting out there these days yeah. so um 
you know, I think I think uh, it, it it it's describing a set of solutions where you're not sure why they work. I, I you know I've I've said a bunch of times in the past like. Um, you know, you look at something like Spotify and they claim how happy their developers are and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, hey, give me six billion dollars to burn in the in a garbage can um, and, you know, and no expectation of profits. I, I bet I can make a bunch of people real happy, too. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and, and even when you when you have six billion dollars to burn in a trash can, you end up with things like the kerfuffle. Um, and more, it's more than a kerfuffle around Google and the AI ethics research. Tim, yep. Timnit, um, uh, Gebru being resignated from your AI ethics team. Uh, you know, you still don't have um, ethical HR processes. You know, so it's you know you can have six billion dollars to burn, but you still burn people and you burn people out, and it's not. Um, and and we at Red Hat we always. Um, pride ourselves, I guess, um, and pride go with before the horse or the cart or whatever, but um, on being open and transparent culture and and growing people too, yeah. you know, and helping people. And so I think what, and the other thing that we always say is that diversity and inclusivity um, is what brings innovation to the party, right? So if everybody's doing groupthink and everybody's even if you're all passionate and the top of your game, you're hiring passionate top of the game people. So it's almost like you're boxing yourself in. You may be super innovative and coding geniuses and going to write the next TensorFlow or whatever it is. Um, or that, but I think it's telling us in some ways at, at Google that Kubernetes was called the Borg yep. before it was called Kubernetes at Google and it was the Borg or a piece of the Borg. I'm sure I'm getting the history quite wrong. Or, uh, but, it, but it's like that Borg-like thinking comes even when you have the best of the best, the most highly paid group of people, if you don't have things that grow your organization. And I think that's that was the thing. And, and there's lots of books out there. I don't mean to pick on the Netflix book, um, which is... There's a great there's a great book that I, I used to when I was a consultant it, 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 I had a requirement if you wanted to work with me that you had to read this one particular book it was, it's actually quite small um, and and the, I love the printing of it the printing is like this beautiful small book and and the book is called Teaching Smart People How to Learn um, and it's by Edgar Schein um, and uh, and it's amazing because it's partially I'm sorry it's by Chris Argyris it, it's amazing because uh, Part of what he basically says, part of the basic argument of the book is that um, the the smartest people you know have the most difficulty learning. And the reason is because they fail less frequently than other people. And really part of what he's pointing out there is that like people don't call them on their bullshit enough. Like they don't know how to accept criticism. They don't know how. And the answer is like they probably are incrementally better than than uh, you know some other option that you might have but they don't learn well and and the result of that is you often get in kind of these situations where the organization gets stuck um, and it can't move forward anymore because it can't kind of like learn and observe from its its uh, its problems it tries to hide the problems instead and I think it's a really super interesting book um, and you know, one of the reasons I used to have people read it was because I did so much kind of management consulting, and those people in particular, managers, middle managers, VPs, executives, they don't really ever want to hear about what they aren't doing well, <laughs> you know. And so you, you have to kind of show them that book and say, like, you know, uh, arguments like meritocracy and these other kind of arguments about like having the best people around you at all times, stuff like that, all of those things uh, can be very useful if you know exactly where you want to go. But when you engage in situations with uncertainty, having certain people, people who are certain of their beliefs, walk into uncertain situations is a really good way to get everyone killed. <laughs> don't, yeah. don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I, I just think it's really interesting. The more we kind of engage in kind of development of systems that kind of um, are 
touching on uncertainty or the more that we engage in systems that are significantly more and more complex, the less certainty we have about their outcomes and the more valuable it becomes to you know, have people who think of being smart as you know, capable of re continuously re-examining their beliefs, right? You know, the, the, the silly Socrates quote, you know, I, I, I know one thing that everybody else doesn't know and that's that I know nothing. Um, and, and, and the way in which the Socratic method is designed to basically teach you that you don't know anything uh, th these are much more interesting long-term ways of getting people to engage directly in the context and work that they're in, I think. So I don't know. I, you know, I, I haven't read, I haven't read the Reed Hastings book, but you know. Yeah, we'll get you there. I, I have it on Kindle because that's, you know, your boss tells you to read something, you automatically download it and you read it and, and you do. And then there's lots of books like that and they fly at you and you read them. And my Kindle has, is packed with books that I was told to read. Um, and, and, you know, and they're still there and, um, I've read them. I think probably the Tim Ferriss books, uh, are, are the ones that, that I read the most. And of all the people who I, you know, I don't want to espouse his theories or anything, but Tim Ferriss lately during COVID, I have gone back to him and his, um, four hour work week, the four hour chef and the yeah. four hour body series, um, yeah. which I bought all the hard copies of and they yeah. sat on my shelf. Um, and, but during COVID, I've picked them up and they've been, um, I've been, I've been reading him again, uh, which is quite interesting because he's more of a, a 90s or early 2000s dude, you know, it came out, I think he came out in the early 2000s and hit it big. But anyways, that's been, that's more self-help um, than organizational help, but it's, he has lots of great ideas and he's the other one. But to, to switch gear. I'm more interested in reading the Netflix book because I think one of the things that people kind of forget about Netflix is that it. It is a good uh, example of an actual transformation. Unlike yeah. all the other uh, fangish uh, organizations that started as kind of like cloud native-ish, like online organizations, uh, you know, Net Netflix transformed itself. It yeah. it was a it, it's it started out as I'm going to email you your I'm sorry I'm going to mail you. That's it's been so a, long. A, since a DVD, long yeah. Them. a DVD, um, and then that gave them just enough of an edge on, um, you know, the rental system at the time that they could kind of continue. But the transformation of recognizing uh, we're going to change the medium of delivery of bits from CDs to internet. Yeah, and the earliness of them recognizing that and really pushing to develop that is like it's it's. I can't think of a really better example of a successful transformation. That's that's one of the best ones I can think of. Well, and I also think the interesting and and you get this in the book, so you you should read the, the No Rules Rules. But you get it. They talk about you know the mythology of you know, bashing you know, catching um, Blockbuster out you know, and under, you know, trying to sell themselves to Blockbuster and thank goodness they didn't. But um, also that initial business that they were, that core business has transformed into, you know, if you go on Netflix now to huge, they're, they're a movie studio, they're a, you know, pr production company, they're, they're, you know, they're much, much more than that. So that watching, and they do talk about this in the book about how they trans, they continually transform it through this methodology that they talk about or this culture that they created. So it's it's not a bad book to read um, by any shot, and 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 it's and and, and they continue to drive out um, from from my perspective in the open source great projects and participate um, in in open source communities in ways that really contribute back. So um, the, I just I'm always leery about. Um, books that uh, elevate rock stars, you know. Um, and, Pigographies are a thing. Yeah, and, and that, that's what I think that's what caught me out. And so I had, to, what is it, my confirmational bias or or whatever it is for li my listening for? Oh God, another Silicon Valley story. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, but I think there are some good bits in it too. But to sort of switch gears a lot, um, and because a lot of what we talked on this year in Transformational Fridays were things about. Um, Demege and Kat and uh, Sasha and other folks came and we talked a lot about um, diversity. One of the books you put on the list was um, 
uh, the Fricker book, Miranda Fricker's um, Epistemic Injustice. You want yeah. to talk a little bit about that? Because I think that is another one of the books that people, if they could get one book this year that they read, that would be a good one. Absolutely. Uh, you know, um, it's been super influential in my thinking recently. Um, I got introduced to it by Kat Swatel, who we had on to talk about it. And I, you know, I think she does a pretty amazing job of uh, talking through it. Um, and so you should go watch that video. But you should also read the book. Um, yes. it, it's got a big, scary title, um, but it's actually, a, a, it's pretty readable. Um, uh, if you can kind of like skim over some of the big words and and I can I always get uh, get caught up on the um, pronouncing of epistemic injustice power and ethics of knowing it's like oh could we put more in one one title than that I don't think so no so. yeah so yeah I mean you know epistemology is kind of like the way of coming to know the world like um, not quite like a method it's more like a way in which we know about the world um and so i i think it's it's a very um very interesting set of theories that lead to some really interesting critiques of things like kind of um you know decision and um rational decision making as the as the focus of ethics um where there's some more interesting ways of thinking about like ethics of caring uh, and what does it mean to care about a system um, and make decisions that kind of reflect your care. Uh, so I think there's a whole set of interesting bits there that are useful that come out of Fricker and some other uh, ethicists these days. And then, you know, from a, from a like a resilience engineering SRE operator kind of perspective, all, you can start asking really interesting questions like, how can we develop a system that we are able to care for, that we have an engagement in, that um, that the decisions that we're making aren't simply to um, increase the efficiency and the um, kind of output of the system, but in fact to make it something we can care for, um, which uh, you know is related to sustainability and the sustainability of our systems and adaptive capacity and all those types of things. So I think there's some really interesting um, stuff there, and I. I teach from this book several different courses this year that I've always, everybody that I've kind of introduced it to has come away with some really interesting insights. So I think it's really awesome. All right, that, that's definitely on there. We have um, someone asking out in um, Twitter land or Twitch land rather about um, when are we going to talk about imposter syndrome for senior leaders like me? And um, yeah, so I, there are, there are like, uh, there's probably 20 books on imposter syndrome and and i actually it's interesting because i think as as a woman that a lot of them are addressing women's um pers yes. ro the, the role of imposter syndrome for for women and you know you can google that and there's like tons of them the, the imposter cure um the secret thoughts of successful women you know and you know how you do that and i don't have one seminal book on imposter sy syndrome that i have but um, it, I, and I haven't run across one for um, senior leaders. Like, I haven't. I, like uh, again, uh, not to push the book that I've already pushed, but the epistemic injustice book uh, has a good. They, she doesn't use the words imposter syndrome, but you can understand what she's talking about as a diagnosis of imposter syndrome. In particular, um, she will describe. Um, Kind of your relationship to knowing the world is is limited by your belief that you can know effectively about the world, and so there's a relationship between kind of doubt uh, and doubt about your own abilities, um, and the way in which one kind of gets or ha perpetrates imposter syndrome upon themselves, and th you know. For, for Fricker, you know, some significant amount of this has to do with the way that um, that that women uh, and people who identify as, uh, as female um, are kind of consistently taught to doubt their own experiences. Yeah. Um, and so I imposter syndrome is an excellent kind of outcome of of kind of being kind of constantly taught that you probably don't 
uh, know what's really happening, and therefore your beliefs are wrong. I, you know, my imposter syndrome I often um, trace back to uh, I, I was diagnosed quite young as as having a, a series of uh, dyslexia, dysgraphia, every every dis you can you can have, and it, the way it was kind of described to me was in essence uh, your your everybody has a brain and it's in a box and most people's brains are just wired to the world differently than your brain is wired to the world. And so I had a, you know, significant kind of epistemic crisis when I was in my early teenage years because I literally thought uh, I can't actually perceive the world the way other people do. I just don't actually physically incapable of doing it, which I'm not entirely sure is exactly right, but it, it, it led to a lot of kind of doubts about uh, what I what I experienced and and uh, how I knew things. Um, one of, one of my favorite kind of examples of that type of thing is like when I when I when my children were young, I would read them children's books like everybody does. And because I'm dyslexic, uh, dyslexics uh, do something uh, called uh, word skipping or word guessing, where um, in order to kind of like scan forward, they'll 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 guess what the next three words are, and then they'll start looking at the next sentence, right? So that so that everything is still coherent. It all kind of sticks together because you pick words that make sense, but you haven't actually read the sentence. And so my yeah. wife would listen to me read these books, and she and we'd get done, and she'd be like. You you do realize that you didn't read the book. <laughs> what you said to them is kind of like what was in the book, <laughs> but it's yeah. you know. And so even from like reading like little little children's books, I had that kind of like experience of like you know doubting my own experiences. And I just think you know there's different extremes to that. And I think Fricker's book does a really good job of kind of explaining how that works and and why you need to be careful about it. There was one other book um, that you put on the list here, um, The Adult Education and Worldview Construction, um, oh, yeah. which I hadn't heard of before. Tell me a little bit about that one. I put these two books together, actually. I put Software Development and Reality Construction, which I think is amazing. That's by Floyd. Um, and that's there's a whole bunch of really interesting essays in there about um, kind of like what, what, what now would be kind of called cognitive engineering, like the way in which the software shapes the way we imagine the world, it's really amazing. And then the book with that I have is, is called Worldview Construction, Adult Education Worldview Construction. And that book is a, kind of about the way in which we create uh, worldviews as a way of kind of working out where we are um, and um, that there's multiple worldviews, like there's multiple ways of looking at the world. So like to bring it like full circle back to the original discussions, right? Like worldviews and kind of constructed realities are versions of systems. They're version, versions of systems thinking. And a worldview is a way of imagining, not the way like a system works, as in like, I imagine my computer works this way, or I imagine my school works this way. A worldview is, I imagine the world that I live in works this way, um, where it's not the world is not um, the the earth or the globe, but like the way in which the totality of my experiences work together, uh, that's a worldview. So like, uh, you know, there's there's different versions of that. Like you could say like capitalism is a worldview, or um, you could say that democracy is a worldview because it's 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 a way of kind of describing how a whole world system works. Um, and the point of the book is roughly to point out that like there are multiple worldviews. And actually, like if you got into that and you were interested in those two books, then I would move from there to there's an amazing book right now that I really love by um, Arturo Escobar. And, and the name of the book is Designs for the Plural Verse. So if you go from worldview, you can go up one more to uh, cosmology or universal system, and um, which is like how do we imagine that the earth came to be and how does that affect how we imagine what we're capable of doing? That's a cosmology, right? So, and you can, lots of different religions have different explanations for how the world came to be. Um, and so a pluriversal system is one in which um, multiple people have a, multiple different understandings of these very long time frames 
of how the world became the way it is and how it's gonna be different in the future. Um, and the foul, so it's like, uh, it's like diversity, but at the kind of, uh, at the at the universe scale, like it's important to have multiple people with different ways of imagining how the universe uh, works is kind of one of the, I don't know, one of the rough arguments that you might want to make. Um, and I think that book is amazing um, to talk about kind of how um, how we need to preserve different ways of being in the world. Um, and I think that's really cool. So, so that that makes me think about. Um long-term thinking and the long now foundation yep. and a gentleman that i met a long time ago um at, funnily enough at south by southwest we were on a panel together danny hillis um uh and i, I had a had a wonderful conversation um wandering around south by what southwest about long-term thinking and the necessity for it and i can't say after coming through 2020 one of the things that I really think is that, like, you know, one, it might finally be the thing that makes me join the Long Now Foundation <laughs> and become a member, um, as opposed to just attending events and, and reading their books. But uh, and I can't think of a book that there's. He actually wrote. I'm just looking here quickly to see if there's a book that he wrote about it. Um, no, 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 no. He, he's yeah. Yeah, the work led to design. He's kind of, he's more of a computer. I'm just trying to think if there's a seminal book that he wrote. But uh, the the thing that that really um, the conversations and 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 I mean to compliment you by this is that having these conversations with you on Fridays has reminded me of these conversations that I got to have with Danny Hillis at that one moment in time and and Southwest and how it really influenced me about thinking about the long term nature of. Um, the work that we do within the corporate organizations that we're in, within the open source things, and the impact it has, and um, really kind of helped me let go of the short term. Um, you still have to be detail oriented. You still have to get that code pushed and those these releases made and everything. But what is the long term impact of the work that we're doing today, and how how we have to look at it from a higher level? Um, and that that really uh, helped. Uh, it must have been I think 2015. 16 or something where I ran into him and um, that so I, I think in long-term thinking systems thinking um, are, are things that for 2021 I think are going to be top of mind um, for me so it's been a, an interesting uh, the clock of the long now is is was published uh, by by the long now foundation and that's quite good Stuart brand uh, of course like brands concepts like um, pace layering and how buildings learn are both really interesting discussions of like multiple temporalities, like long and short term temporalities existing together. I think there's some super interesting stuff there. Uh, seeing like a state is really cool. Um, I think uh, as an example of like thinking in long time periods um, and understanding how, uh, you know, again, a state is something that's supposed to exists beyond the individual uh, people who exist in it you know, for mm -hmm. a long time. So I think that can be super interesting. Uh, and that's a great book that everybody should look at at some point. The Pattern Language uh, by, by uh, Alice, uh, Christopher Alexander, the opposite, like kind of long, long backward thinking, like uh, the way in which like uh, history informs, I guess, or materiality informs things is also super interesting. And then the, the other one that like I always like to talk to people about when they talk about long-term thinking is Donna Harway's book. It's called uh, Staying with the Trouble uh, is amazing and really interesting. And um, for again, for operators, for people who um, kind of exist in a system or uh, you know within a social uh, social technical system, that one I think is really um, super interesting and, and super fun. So. so all that said, we're almost to the end of our hour, or we are at the end of our hour, but we started late. So I'm, I'm gonna make Chris stay for a few more seconds to produce this. What is the book that you're reading now? Oh, the book that I'm reading right now is uh, this, uh, Lessons, uh, Life Lessons from Bergson. Um, so Bergson was, uh, in his time was maybe the most famous uh, continental philosopher. Um, and he actually got in a huge fight with Einstein about whether time exists or not, which I think is kind of an interesting conversation they had. 
But Bergson um, talks about a couple things. One of them is duration, which is the idea that like um, if you think about – most people think about time as like being measurable, like there's a beginning and an end. Um, and duration's more about like the stuff in the middle between the beginning and the end. And um, sometimes I describe it as like the sensation of pulling your finger down a window pane. Like there's – you can tell that things are moving, but there's no beginning and ending to it. It's just an ongoingness. Um, and then the other thing he talks about is extensity and intensity. So extensity is like the things that we can measure outside of ourselves. So these tend to be measurable by scientific instruments. But intensity is the experiences inside of you, like your uh, the sensation of music or the sensation of dancing. And he talks about uh, both of them having an idea of like volume or big loudness or quietness or things like you know your intent your intensity uh your experience of love for instance you could describe it as being muted or Im impassioned right um and he basically argues that um that a significant part of the human experience uh is is lost when we only view kind of output like extensities and that we need to understand intensities more um, so I think it's my I, I write about time in my dissertation. So he's what Bergson is one of my favorites, and this is like a nice thin book. It's it's uh yeah. It's what I'm, I'm thinking that that's that might be a good one after all of the other books that we've discussed, um, or mm -hmm. or as a topper. Uh, so so if um, you're listening to this, I'm going to try and annotate this video um, in some way, shape, or form to to help people find these books. Maybe create like instead of a YouTube playlist, uh, uh, an Audible playlist or a book. But I really like the physical books. So to me, I think one of the things is is really um, getting back to reading real books and not on Kindle and stuff, um, and trying to do a few more of those this year. So um, it has been intense, shall we say. And um, I really I look forward to 2021 and having more conversations and um, getting um, my book list um, built here and, and reading through some of these things. And if um, you're out there in um, YouTube land and you're watching this video in the comments below, um, put in your suggestions of, of books that we should be reading um, about things that are transformational for you or books that were transformational for you or your organization. Um, and, and I promise that I will reread the No Rules Rules book again um, without my confirmational bias hat on and, um, and be ready for my uh, conversation about that book at, at some future meeting. So, um, and maybe we'll even get um, some of our Netflix colleagues to, uh, in the open source world to join us and talk about um, what it's like working at Netflix. So there you go. Um, that is about next week too, Greg. I, I, I talked to Greg this week about his talk on um, kind of resilience theory next week. I think it's going to be really awesome. I'm super excited for it. Yeah. So we, as always, um, we've got one more coming up. And um, so we'll see you again next Friday. And um, we'll have, um, have more on the table for you. So thanks, everybody, for joining us today and for listening afterwards. And um, thanks, Jabe, for making the time again today. Thank Much you. Take yep. care. Talk soon. Bye.